Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, I'd like to introduce Paul Bionic, who is Development Director for Conservation Northwest. He'll talk a little bit about Conservation Northwest mission and then turn things over to our guest speaker, Scott, who will tell you about the return of werewolves to the Pacific North... Sorry, wolves. Too close to Halloween. The return of wolves to the Pacific Northwest. Thanks. Thanks, Ted. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name's Paul Bannock, and um, Conservation Northwest is hosting this event today. And as Ted mentioned, I'm development director. Conservation's Northwest's whole reason for being is connecting the wild areas from the coast all the way to the Canadian Rockies. The Cascades appear big and wild when we see them on the map, but if you look closer, you can see there's a number of points in which they're potentially cut off from lifeblood that they need to have sustainable populations of wildlife. So animals such as wolves and wolverine and lynx and other animals that we want to be in the Cascades for generations to come need us to work on linking the Cascades to the Canadian Rockies, to the Coast Range and other places. Our current campaign is a Columbia Highlands initiative where we are connecting the Cascades to the Rockies through the Colville National Forest in northeastern Washington and we're going to create several hundred thousand acres of wilderness and we're going to make we're going to take that one million acres of the Colville National Forest and put two-thirds of it under conservation objectives for the aim of connecting again the Cascades and the Rockies. The reason you're here today though is to hear from Scott Fitkin and Scott is a 21-year veteran of the Department of Wildlife and he is uh, He's one of our charismatic megafaunas himself, but, but Scott is the guy in the state closest to the most charismatic of our clawed creatures. Lynx, wolverines, wolves. He's intimately involved in studying them in the Cascades, and he is the one who knows more than anyone about the recovery of wolves in Washington State, particularly in the Cascades. And he's going to give us an inside look into um, the wolves' recovery and our efforts to make sure that's successful. Right. Scott, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So just real quickly, a little background. I have worked for the agency for 21 years. I work for the state of Washington, the state, the state Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, and there's a lot of agencies and I know it gets confusing but um, I started my career on what was called a grizzly bear gray wolf investigations project and I spent six or seven years chasing ghosts around the North Cascades and that was uh, fun challenging um, I'll touch on a little bit of what we turned up in those early years but it was fairly scant but more recently we have had wolves returning to the North Cascades and so I'm going to focus on that aspect of, of wolf biology and wolf ecology, that, that being um, essentially kind of the biological piece. I'll touch a little bit on management, not, not so much. That's almost another talk in and of itself. Um, and I won't talk too much about what's going on over in the Rockies. We're going to stay fairly Washington-centric, in fact, North Cascade-centric in this talk. So, um, Paul, should we do lights, do you think? All righty. Well, wolves, I've worked on a lot of different critters over the years, and wolves probably more than any other generate strong emotions in the public sector. And it, it tends to be a very polarizing animal, and it, brain, it runs the gamut from those who think they're just a slightly wilder version of man's best friend, kind of warm and fuzzy, to sort of this uh, paranoid vision that they're out there to, you know, eat us and, and all the livestock on the landscape. Well, the truth, like with most of these issues, is really lies somewhere in the middle. And um, I think most people would agree that the wolf is somewhat of an iconic wilderness or wildland species, that there's a lot of mystique and legend surrounding this animal. 
Well, what is a wolf? Well, it is a member of the canid or the dog family, and here in North America and in the Northwest in particular, the other two members of that family would be foxes and coyotes that you might be familiar with. They're a little more common, a little more visible typically, both of which occur in the North Cascades. The, the red fox, um, we actually have a very rare version of that. It's called the Cascades red fox, and it lives up in the high country. So wolves and coyotes, if you're out in the field, um, how do you know what you're looking at? Well, there's a couple of key things to keep in mind. Obviously, a wolf is much larger. It probably weighs, on average, about three times what a coyote weighs. And its, its physical size is probably roughly double the size of a coyote or close to it. And it's got a bigger blockier head. It's got bigger feet for its body size. It has... Um, kind of a more robust snout. Coyotes tend to have long pointy nose, tall pointy ears. And to give you more concrete examples, on the left are a couple of wolves, an adult and a pup, and on the right are a couple of coyotes. So that kind of gives you a visual of um, what you might see out in the field. Now, obviously, wolves, um, depending on what part of North America you're talking, range anywhere from about 70 pounds on up to maybe 125 for a big male. Now there are yeah, they're a little bigger than a German Shepherd, and they're definitely taller than a German Shepherd. They're leggier. Coyotes, you know, 25 to 40 pounds. Tracks. Wolf tracks are essentially an awful lot like a big domestic dog. And so there, it, actually you can't, in the field, you can't um, definitively identify a wolf track versus a dog track. But it's a big dog track. So there aren't too many dog breeds that leave a track that's four to five and a half inches long in snow or mud. Um, the other thing, to, when you look at a canid track, it's a four-toed track, or I should say a wolf's track maybe specifically. It's very symmetrical. If you drew a line down the middle of that track, it'd be a mirror image on either side. Keep that in mind. And, oh, and then on the right there, just for an interesting dynamic, the, uh, the snow picture on the left, those are coyote tracks, and on the right, those are North Cascade wolf tracks that happen to be in the same place at about the same time. So that gives you kind of a, a scale, a size scale. That, that little knife in the photographs is about four inches long. Now there's a variety of other critters out there that you might confuse with a, a wolf if you find tracks. Probably the most similar is the cougar, and that's on the left here. Cougar's also four-toed, um, about the same size, on average a little smaller than a wolf track, but a um, couple of differences to point out. A cougar track is not symmetrical the way a wolf track is. It's twisted a little bit, one toe sticks up farther, especially on the front track, which is the top track in the, the top photo. It's got three lobes on the back of the palm pad here, whereas a wolf track is very triangular in, the, in its palm pad. Claw marks generally don't show in a cat. They almost always show in a canid or a dog. Lynx, far right, great big track for such a small animal, but it's a lot of fur on their foot, so it's usually really indistinct, and it's very round. Um, and you're not going to see the nice crisp pad marks like you would on a wolf. Lower right is a wolverine track. Some of you may be lucky enough sometime to stumble across a wolverine track. It's wolf-sized, believe it or not, even though it's a sm much smaller animal. But it's got five toes, which most of the time show up in the track. The palm pad, which are the inner digital pad on the wolverine, is like, kind of like an upside-down V or a chevron shape. And so if you look close, you can distinguish, but it's easy to make mistakes. Let's talk a little bit about wolf ecology. Uh, interestingly, um, they were at one time, I don't know if this is still true, maybe, the, the most widely distributed mammal on the, on the planet. They're circumpolar, that is, they occur old world and new world. They range from the subtropics in India all the way up to the high Arctic in Canada. So widely dispersed over a uh, wide range of habitats. They are very territorial. They cover their home range sizes run from anywhere from 50 to 1,000 square miles and anywhere in between. And it's not uncommon for them to travel long distances straight lines, 600, 500, 600 miles in a dispersal event. They breed at about two to three years of age, typically, and uh, their average litter is between five and six pups. And in a, uh, an, a non exploited or an unhunted population, you could expect them to live like 8 to 13 years. So they're really similar to your dog at home in terms of their, their physiology, their lifespan, and even their genetics, quite frankly, aren't that far removed from your domestic dog. 
Well, what's life in the year of a wolf like? Well, I, I guess you could say it starts in February because that's, that's breeding season at this latitude. And 63 days later, just like your domestic dog, they're going to give birth in a den, which is usually a hole dug into the ground or under a root wad or somewhere that um, affords it a fair amount of cover. Generally, at this latitude, there's still some snow on the ground, at least in places in April. And about eight weeks later, they'll be weaned and they'll be um, beginning to make four way, forays away from the den. And in fact, at that point, they may move to what we call a rendezvous site. And that's just a spot where the pack more or less sets up shop and, and creates an area where they can leave the pups while the adults go out and hunt. And by 12 weeks, the animals are actually just uh, able to start moving with the adults as they start cruising their summer territory and go on their hunting forays. And by seven or eight months, so we're talking into the fall now, about this time of year, they're beginning to actively hunt with the adult pack members. And by the end of the year, they're pretty much full size or close to it. So what do wolves need, or what are their life history requirements? What kind of habitat do they require? Well, they're a generalist. You know, I told you they were circumpolar, uh, ranged across a wide range of latitudes. They're, they're, they're really not tied to a specific habitat. So say, for instance, compared to a spotted owl that's an old growth critter, or a beaver that's got to live in a wetland. Wolves live in all kinds of habitats. They really, I tell people they really only need two things. They need an, uh, uh, an adequate prey base, which, is, which in this case, for an animal like this, means ungulates, ungulates being hoofed animals. So they need deer, elk, moose, those kinds of critters to feed on. And they basically need us not to, not to kill them. Those are really the only two requirements for wolves to do okay. Now, they do prey on a variety of secondary prey items. There's a lot of small mammals that get eaten by wolves. Um, a couple of note, beavers, I think, are pretty important throughout much of the range of the wolf in North America as secondary prey. And locally here in the North Cascades, we think hoary marmots are fairly important too. But there's a lot of regional prey avail uh, availability. So for instance, up in Alaska, coastal BC areas where you've got big fish runs, they'll actually come down and feed on salmon and they're, they're actually quite good at it. Sometimes they even put the bears to shame. Um, Along the coast, they'll utilize marine resources, so you know, they'll find hauled out seals, or they'll even uh, pick up stuff along the high tide mark on beaches. They are uh, a fairly effective, or a very effective predator, uh, but they do have their limitations. Um, they're they're a, what we call a coursing predator. So they're, they're most effective when they have open terrain, not super steep, so they can use their endurance and their teamwork to bring animals down. They're not as effective on steeper terrain or broken terrain. And so, for instance, bighorn sheep and goats, they're, they're not typically a major predator on, on those types of species. That would be a niche that maybe a cougar would, would fill. You know, I say they're an effective predator. Their efficiency, though, is maybe not what you would expect. And this little graphic's interesting. This is from back east. I think this is Isle Royal. Um, and it was a little study done following wolves to see, OK, how often does a wolf successfully make a kill? Well, if you start off at the top with 131 moose detected by wolves, by the time you get to the bottom, only six of the animals actually get, get killed. So there's a lot of ways that they can fail. The animals simply leave before the wolves can get to them. They can outrun them. In the case of a large animal like a moose, they can even fight them off. So it, it's, it's um, trying to make a living with just your teeth is difficult. And so th these guys have to work at it. Probably one of the, um, oh, the stuff you'll see on a lot of nature shows and that's been the subject of many books is wolf behavior because it is pretty interesting. They're a social animal, so there's a group dynamic. And I think they, wolves, I think, really fascinate people because we are so familiar with dogs. There, there is kind of a natural connection with these guys as well for a lot of people. And just a few quick things about behavior. Typically in a pack, there's just one breeding pair. Now, there are a lot of exceptions to that, particularly, for instance, in Yellowstone, when they first reintroduced wolves there into an incredibly prey-rich environment. They, they had many cases where they documented more than one pair in a pack breeding, but generally it's just one. They have a dominance hierarchy, so you have an alpha pair that's the breeding pair, and then kind of a, a list of subordinates, all the way down to what's called an omega animal, which is kind of the pack scapegoat. And um, he's sort of the stress release valve, which is not the spot you want to be in a pack. And yet, 
the question then that it gets asked is, well, if you're the omega animal and you're taking a lot of this abuse, why would you hang around this, this group? Well, in the group dynamic, your hunting opportunities are better, your opportunities to get food and potentially find a mate tend to be better as well. So it's, 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 there's a trade-off there. Um, they do, you know, they're, they're very attentive to their pups. When the pack goes out hunting, they usually leave one of the subordinate adults with the pups as a babysitter. And of course, um, wolves like to howl. And that's a, uh, has anyone heard a wolf howling in the wild in this room? A couple people? Yeah, you don't, you don't forget it if you hear that. Um, and I'll play a couple of howls for you. It, it's, um, I don't know, I, I, it's probably the um, most well-known wilderness wildlife sound. And they, they do it for a variety of reasons, a few of which would be to locate each other. They do it as kind of a bonding uh, behavior when they're together uh, as a pack. And they'll do it like an advertisement or a warning, uh, particularly near a den or rendezvous site. Um, this is kind of a little bit technical. I'll try not to be too long-winded, but this is a really fascinating subject. So wolves are what we call a keystone species. And what we mean by that is they're a species that has kind of a top-down significant effect on the community they live in, all the, the other uh, plants and animals. And so here's an example of how wolves function as a keystone species. Early on in Yellowstone Park, wolves were extirpated by the early part of the 20th century, completely eliminated from the, from the park. Well, predictably, the elk did really well in the absence of wolves. In fact, they got to the point where they were having fairly significant impacts on the vegetation. When wolves were reintroduced back into the park in 1995, I believe it was, um, immediately <clears throat> they figured out that they had this superabundance of elk as prey, and in fact their diet, at least for the first 10 years of reintroduction, was about 90% elk. And so they were, you know, they were changing, they had an effect on elk numbers, but they also significantly changed elk behavior, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And that led to some reestablishment of riparian vegetation. So with the riparian vegetation, beavers had an opportunity to come back. So then that, that trophic cascade or that ecosystem effect continues. So with beavers, you get dams, you get wetlands. That means new plant communities, new, new riparian communities. New riparian communities meant fish returned and songbirds like yellow warblers that had been absent came back. So there was this whole interrelated effect of, of reintroducing a large keystone predator. And this is just kind of a graphic I stole from National Geographic that summarizes that whole idea. On the left, you've got the before situation, lots of elk camping in the riparian, very little riparian vegetation, eroding stream banks, no aspen, cottonwood regeneration. Wolves come back, move elk up out of the bottom into the open where they're less um, susceptible to predation. You got riparian coming back, all the critters associated with that returning, aspen starting to regenerate. And a couple of other little side notes with wolves. wolves. When wolves came back to Yellowstone, they were kind of hard on coyotes. Well, that had a ripple effect also. Coyotes, as it turns out, were, were the major predator on pronghorn fawns. And they also directly tended to compete, and, compete with and kill red foxes. So when the wolves came back, coyote numbers fell, pronghorn numbers went up, fox numbers went up. So there's this interesting interrelated dynamic. Okay, um, I, I need to touch real briefly on the management of wolves, kind of the nuts and bolts of some of the policy and um, less glamorous <laughs> issues that I have to deal with when, when you work on a species like this. They were federally listed in 1974, state listed in 1980, and they're currently still state and federally endangered. And they are really an example of an endangered species success story. So real, just real quick here, Historic gray wolf range in the upper right, that's probably a conservative estimate, actually. Um, by the time they were listed in the 70s, this map down here in the lower left, there were just a few hundred left in the northern tip of Minnesota. What are the actual legal consequences of being federally and state? What does it actually mean to be federally and state listed as endangered? It means you cannot uh, kill them, essentially, other than protecting your life, particularly if they're endangered status at, at the federal level and at the state level for so that. If it started listed already, what does it mean that they later became listed as state endangered? Um, it just, that, the state listing more or less, 
I mean, that, that's a good question. It doesn't change a lot on the ground. It essentially means that the state's recognizing that both at the state level and at the federal level, they're in trouble. Um, lower right. So after the introductions in Idaho and in Wyoming and some natural recolonization in, in Montana, wolves began to come back and they did so rapidly. And they were also um, coming back naturally in the Great Lakes. So this, then that map's a little dated, obviously. It doesn't show Washington in the current range, and there should be some points there for Washington. But now we've got probably three to 4,000 wolves in the Great Lakes and uh, probably a couple thousand in the Northern Rockies and Washington combined. And there's a few on the Mexican Recovery Wolf Project down in the Southwest that I won't really touch on. Just to give you an example, though, of how successful the reintroduction effort was, Here's a graph of wolf numbers in Montana. So wolves started showing up there late, very end of the 70s, into the 80s, and they kind of trickled along. You know, there was one, two packs maybe for a number of years, and we get into the 90s, and there's maybe another pack or two. And then when wolves were reintroduced in 95 in Idaho and Wyoming, a couple years later when they'd had a chance to establish and, and started dispersing, Montana numbers, you know, just did the parabolic curve thing. And to look at the Rockies as a whole, this is kind of interesting, because again, early in the northern Rockies, trickling along, natural recolonization from Canada, they put wolves into Yellowstone in 95, Idaho in 96, and it was just a small number, you know, a few dozen animals. And there we go, up to where we're now, probably close to 2,000 animals in the northern Rockies. And that's just give, give you an idea of where the packs in the northern Rockies are, as of a couple of years ago, anyway well distributed throughout Idaho, western Montana, and western half of Wyoming. So what about here in Washington? Well, you know, we, um, we, wolves were once common here. I don't think there's any doubt. We, we know that there were thousands of pelts traded at the four forts around Washington early on back in the 1800s. Now, not, not all of those animals came from Washington, but certainly a, a number of them did. But like most of the rest of the West, by the late 1800s, early 1900s, we were persecuting wolves pretty heavily, and we pretty much eliminated them from Washington by the 1930s. Since that time, there was the occasional dispersing animal, um, but nothing in the way of documented pack activity. Like I said, I started my career on a gray wolf grizzly bear investigations project, and we really started kind of paying attention to wolves about 1990. We'd been getting reports from the Hosamine area at the north end of Ross Lake since the 80s, so in those early years, we did, we went into what uh, we thought was a rendezvous site where someone had reported seeing wolves feeding marmots to pups, and sure enough, we found all these marmot pieces and deer leg bones and kind of a classic rendezvous site with a little bit of cover under this rock and water nearby. But we really weren't able to document the animals themselves. We got, oh, one self-activated camera picture of a lone individual over the years. And some of the, it, of, of note is the fact that a lot of our good, credible public observations were occurring in the Twist River drainage, and I'll point out the significance of that later. But this is, so this is the early 90s. And along the way, we had some complications. So for instance, hybrids were an issue. There were oh, probably three, four, five times where we went out to investigate a report, and it turned out being somebody's hybrid that had gotten loose or was roaming free, but typically fairly close to human settlement. Then in the early 90s, we got a report from Hosamine, which is a pretty remote area, and, and we, we knew we had had wolf activity up there previously. So we rushed up there, and sure enough, I got this picture of this animal out on the flats there at Hosamine. Big to do, went into national um, magazines and periodicals, wolves returned to Washington. Well, several years after the fact, I got a call one day and said, Scott, have you read this book called The, Woman, the Wolf, the Woman in the Wilderness? I said, no, I haven't even heard of it. Well, yeah, I think you better take a look. So, okay. Well, as soon as I started thumbing through the book, it was apparent right off the bat that this animal was a captive reared animal that this woman had released. It was kind of her born free experience and well-intentioned but not well-executed and not really a very good idea. So by 1995, Funding pretty much dried up, and for about a 10-year period from 95 to 2005, nobody was really paying attention to wolves in the North Cascades. And then about that time, we started to get an increase in the public sightings that were being reported, and that was true both in the Okanagan, where I work, and over in the northeast part of the state. And in the northeast part of the state, we even started to get some self-activated camera pictures. 
Well, we knew because they had introduced wolves into Idaho, and that had been so successful, as I showed in those earlier graphics, that we were going to get wolves coming into Washington soon from the east. And we also knew, based on our past experience, that there was some connectivity north with, with Canada. So the agency decided, well, let's get out in front of this. Let's not wait for them to get here and, and, um, and be behind the, the curve. Let's be proactive and develop a conservation and management plan anticipating the arrival of these critters. And so real quickly, this, this is like a whole talk in and of itself, and this is a subject to public meetings, so I'm not going to go into detail. But they put together a working group which had stakeholders from all over the state, from ranching communities, environmental communities, sportsmen, whoever. And they said, they just put them all in a room and said, okay, this is your guys' plan. You guys figure out how we're going to conserve wolves in Washington given your competing interests. And so they started with only two sideboards. No wolves was not an option, and bringing wolves in from outside the state was not an option. Otherwise, everything was on the table. You guys hash it out. So they went through a number of steps, came up with a plan, which is now in draft status. And we got, as you might expect, we got huge amounts of public comment on this draft plan. And so we're in the process of incorporating that. So this process is ongoing. The plan's not finalized. But just real quick, boil the whole, I don't know how many pages this draft plan is, boil it down to like two slides. Really what people are concerned about is how many wolves and where are they going to be. And the preferred, um, preferred alternative, so to speak, uh, that the agency has put forward, or the, the working group, I should say, has put forward at this time, divides the state into three areas. North Cascades, Eastern Washington, and kind of the Olympic South Cascades chunk. And the idea is we'd, we would consider um, the animal to be in good shape and, uh, and um, potentially subject to being fully delisted, that is taken off the state and federal list, when we have 15 breeding pairs spread throughout these three zones. But what's a breeding pair? Well, a breeding pair, very simply, is at least two adults <clears throat> with, with two pups of the year still alive on December 31st. Well, in other words, they breed in February. By the end of the calendar year, if they've still got a couple of pups on the ground and you've still got at least the main alpha pair, that's a breeding pair. And if that pair persists for three years, they become um, officially uh, a breeding pair that, that then gets plugged into this little chart that says, all right, when we have so many breeding pairs with a certain distribution statewide, we'll go from endangered to threatened, threatened to sensitive, sensitive to delisted. So that's boiling down like an hour talk on wolf management into a couple slides. So, oh, one little tidbit. <clears throat> Although one of the sideboards of the plan was you can't bring wolves in from Canada or Idaho or wherever. We can move them within the state. So for instance, if all the wolves are piling into eastern Washington, in order to affect recovery more quickly in the Cascades, we do have the option, theoretically, under this plan to move animals within the state. So about this time, just about the time this plan was, was starting, this process was starting, Sightings really started to pick up, and this is where the talk gets a little more interesting, and you'll see some, some local critters here. Sightings really started to pick up in the Okanagan and in northeast Washington. And in May of 2008, with the help of volunteers from Conservation Northwest, we got this photo of an animal <coughs> in the Methow. <coughs> and I've got to tell you, this was, uh, this was an interesting photo. It was kind of grainy. It's black and white. It was an infrared shot because it was kind of dark. And none of us really knew quite what to make of that animal. We weren't sure what it was, because it just, you know, it, was just, it just looked a little funny. About a month later in June, at a camera, actually at one of our wolverine traps, we got this photograph. And when I saw this one, I said, OK, that's it. We, that's a wolf. There's no question in my mind. Well, there was a lot of uh, skepticism over in the Rockies that, in fact, even that animal was a wolf. And I won't go into the lengthy email chain and discussions we have. <laughs> but. Um, <clears throat> We started to get more and more pictures, including pictures rubbing on our scent attractants, you know, and it was getting very intriguing. So this is June of 2008. And shortly thereafter, we started getting howling reports, and so not just single animals, but multiple animals, and people saying they thought they heard pups. And so one of the ways you can find wolves and confirm wolves and confirm re reproduction is to go out and howl for them and try to get them to respond to you. And so in July, in fact, on the same day that we got this photo at one of our camera sites, I went out and said, OK, we're going to go howl up these guys and see what's going on. So we did that. And I want to make sure. 
Make sure the volume's up. Okay. So you hear that, that's mostly pups, <clears throat> those little higher pitched ones, and then there was that deep tone in the back. That's one of the adults that had stayed behind with the pups. So that was a big day. We, you know, we knew we had pups, we knew we had a reproducing pack, we knew we had pups of the year on the ground. So that kind of put us into kind of a hyperactive mode in terms of documenting what we had and, and really trying to do some follow-up. And so we initiated a capture effort. We knew where the rendezvous site was, and like the next day we'd caught the alpha pair which was fortunate. If you're going to catch wolves, it's nice to catch the breeding uh, adults because, you know, they're going to stick with the territory and show you where the den site is and all that other good stuff. And a couple of interesting things about these animals. Um, and this, this was, with the photos, the capture, the DNA work, this really is the first fully documented pack in Washington in 70 years. I think we'd had a couple around earlier, but we were never able to really document them. A couple of interesting things are, this is our male. Um, he's old, you know, his incisors are worn, he's got this snaggletooth canine, he, he was clearly a veteran critter. And that was two years ago and he's still, still running around with his collar and, and seeming seem to be doing okay. That's our alpha female on the right. And what we found out, which was really intriguing, not that surprising to me, it was surprised to a lot of people, but um, the, the genetics tell us that these animals are linked to coastal British Columbia. Now, how many generations back that goes, I have no idea. But at some point, there's a history that traces back to coastal BC. And if you look at our animals, it's interesting because their, their morphology or their appearance is pretty similar. On the right are a couple of pictures of coastal BC critters, and on the left is, our, is one of our... Um, well, we don't know exactly who that is, but it's a pack member. And this is, this is our... Uh, alpha female. And you see the red, the red in the legs and the red in the ears, similar, and kind of the facial mask. There's just, and these are, the, the coastal wolves are a little bit less robust than the Rocky Mountain wolves, a little smaller, a little bit slighter build. So for instance, we mentioned weights. I said a male goes up to maybe 125, typically in the Rockies, an alpha male. These guys, mom was 70 pounds when we caught her, and dad was 85. So they're a little bit smaller. It's very similar to coastal BC. And we started doing follow-up. So then, all right, we knew we had pups. We got our alpha pair collared, so we're, gonna, we're starting to get some territory information. Well, how many pups do we have? Well, again, Conservation Northwest stepped up, helped us run a bunch of cameras with volunteers, and just like the day after we caught Dad, they got a picture of him on one of their cameras, so we knew he was back up and healthy and running around like he should be. And a few days later, they got this now fairly famous photograph of six pups. So this was a big day for us. Not only did we have pups, we had this healthy litter of six animals. We thought at the time we had at least a minimum of four adults. So as of July 2008, we knew we had a minimum of 10 animals on the ground in the Meadow. Just a quick diversion. Self-activated cameras have become a wonderful tool. Uh, they, we started using those 20 years ago, and they were 30 pounds in an ammo box with a giant battery and, you know, 36 picture limitations with film. Now they've developed to where it's all digital, we can do movies. I mean, they're just a tremendous tool. And so, just to give you a couple of examples of the kind of things we get. Bears are always fun. They're always entertaining. They're not very camera shy. In fact, sometimes they can be a bit of a pest. Because they like to get, like, pretty much right up close in person. <laughs> <laughs> and they will occasionally knock our cameras down, but for the most part, they're just fun. So here's a couple of little guys. And here's an interesting shot of a coyote. Coyotes are really jumpy. They're, you know, they're, they're pretty skittish, but this one really liked our scent, and so he just couldn't quite leave. So it's, it's great fun. When you go and you pick up the memory card out of the camera, it's always kind of like Christmas. Okay, what's on it this time? The camera's often 
they triggered usually by sort of good quality footage of large animals like this, or is it sort of somebody has to go through them and it's mostly just the wind blowing junk around? No, it's um, it's heat. It's actually there. It's an infrared sensor. So it's, it's heat of the animal versus the background. It's the difference that, that triggers it and the movement of that heat across the field of view. So winter work. So we, in the fall, like I said, or in the summer, we, with that we had 10 animals. And as we moved into snow season, then we started snow tracking. And as we get towards the end of the calendar year, you know, we want to verify, do we have a breeding pair? Do we have that alpha pair plus at least two pups of the year that survived all the way to the end of December? Well, we know on December 11th, and again, this is 2008, we got a visual of eight animals. So it's like, yeah, we're on our way to breeding pair status. Then we had a little snag. <clears throat> and we, um, we had a poaching incident that, frankly, is still an active investigation. The case, the charges haven't all been filed and hasn't gone to trial. So I can't talk about it much. But um, in all likelihood, we had some mortality in our pack. And so breeding pair status, we're still not sure for 2008. What we do know is about a year later from when we originally documented these guys, so this would be May of 2009, we had three animals left on the ground that we knew about. Our original alpha pair, both of them survived, and one pup from the previous litter, which was now a yearling, is what we were starting with in 2009. And to what extent that was human-induced mortality versus dispersal, we don't know. The good news was our female was very pregnant at that time. We got a good look at her one day. And she looked like she was ready to pop. This, that was actually in April. So in 2009, pretty much the same pattern. We started getting, we knew roughly where they were denning. We started getting reports from people that they were hearing pops. And uh, so once again, we went out to howl them up. Then the squirrel chimed in and made it really difficult to hear. But, um, you know, great news again, multiple pups on the ground. Couldn't, weren't sure how many. It didn't sound like maybe quite as many as the year before. So we, we had cameras up again and big, big effort again with Conservation Northwest volunteers included. And we got a few nice little videos of pups, but we never, we never got more than two pups in any one photograph or video. So it's kind of like, hmm, I don't know. And we put a lot of effort into this, and we, we just couldn't um, nail down what we had. Then finally in the fall, we started getting some more photographs at a new site. This one, it's hard to tell, but there's at least three pups here on the ground. They're getting pretty big now, and I think that's an adult up above. And then we got up in a helicopter. We were doing mountain goat surveys. And we thought, you know, since we're up here, let's go see if we can find the wolves and get a visual. Well, it worked out really well. And let me... Uh, Let me play this for you. So we're in a helicopter. I apologize. It's a little shaky hand shooting video from a bouncing helicopter is really hard. It's, I, I don't have the planet Earth gyroscopically balanced <laughs> camera, you know, on the bottom. But the good news is we saw pups. Those are pups running off to the right. There's a third one. Then there's a fourth one standing there with what is our radio collared female. We got a good look at her. And it's funny, she really... Helicopters don't bother her at all. She just doesn't really seem to care. But that was a big day. So then we knew we had at least four pups on the ground. That made us feel a little better. It's like, okay, I think we'll make breeding pair status by the end of the year. And then in December, when we were flying deer surveys, we got lucky and actually flew right into the pack. And so here's a shot of our alpha male. He doesn't like helicopters much. So he was pretty much out of there. But he did stop and pause, give us a nice look. And then he took off. So that was encouraging, and we did, let's see. We, we still, at that point, we were still confident we had seven animals total. So we still had our four pups, we had our alpha pair, and we had the yearling from the year before. 
Oh, and here's one other video of a couple of the pups. So you can see they're getting pretty big now. And notice uh, the adult male, I don't know if you noticed, he had his tail straight up behind him, and that's usually a sign of um, a less subordinate animal. Um, look at the tails on these guys. It's funny, these little pups. First of all, they don't know what to do. So they're looking over at Dad, kind of taking cues from him. Well, we should be run? I don't, you know. And they've got their tails kind of tucked up under their legs, being acting real subordinate. They keep turning around and looking at Dad like, why are you running? They got their, their, their winter coats have come in, you know, so they're, they're robust looking, really beautiful, beautiful pelts. So that was a big day. Well, we continued winter work into <clears throat> winter of this year, I guess it is now, and we had our still, we had our six or seven animals consistently over the winter. We had did snow tracking and camera work again, and pictures at night are pretty cool. Um, so in the spring, it seemed like it was going to be business as usual again. Got a photograph of mom. She's really fat. You know, she's pregnant. This is, what is that, 21st of April, so she's going to pop any day. Um, <laughs> Using the same den site that we had now actually visited, and, and well, it was pretty well documented. Well, and we actually found a spot where we could watch the den area from a ridge, like a mile and a quarter away with a spotting scope. And we were getting visuals on the animals. We were all excited. We couldn't wait for the puppies to come out of the den, you know, and see the pups and count them. Well, on the 12th of May, we lost mom's signal. We never got another visual. We haven't heard from her since. She's just vanished. The uh, activity at the den went down considerably after that, and um, we don't know. We don't know um, to what extent poaching may have been involved, uh, disease. We, we just have no idea at this stage. What we, happens the, so the, what happens to the radio collar? I mean, the radio collar. He's but dead and laying there. You still, we should be able to find it. Or, well, or if the animal had just died from, say, disease, it would have still been working, and we would have been able to locate it and find her. No signal, no visuals, nothing. Just like she vanished off the face of the earth. We did try to catch. We don't know. I can't absolutely say that for sure. It's kind of coincidental, though, that the signal and you know her physical presence seemed to disappear at pretty much the same time. Personally, I think she was probably poached. We tried to catch another animal or two because that meant we only had one radio collar left in the pack, and it was on our old male, which is a little tenuous. We did not catch any. They just were not using the landscape the same way, and I think that's because the, I think, I think she gave birth. I think there were pups on the ground. I got a glimpse of one, one evening, right at dusk in early May, and that was it. That's the only pup evidence we had. Well, Dad, that's a picture of Dad. He's continuing to use the territory right up till today, just like they have in the past, but we don't, right now, we know at least on a couple of occasions he's been traveling with at least one other individual. And that's pretty much all we know at this stage. So our, you know, our pack status is kind of unknown. The good news is a wolf territory tends to persist even when the players change. So the fact that we've still got some animals in the area, it's likely this territory will continue to be occupied as long as there's some more individuals around. So just to sort of shift gears quickly for a second, about the same time wolves were showing up in the Methow, we're starting to get increased activity in northeast Washington. And in 2009, in fact, we were able to capture the alpha male in what's called the diamond pack up in the Selkirks. They had six pups in 2009 that we got an additional satellite collar on them in 2010. They're doing well. And this year, um, we collared a several month old pup from what we think is another new pack in northeast Washington. We just don't know if it's centered in Idaho, Canada, or Washington at this point because it's way up there in the corner. So the state as a whole, wolf. Uh, wolf colonization is proceeding. In the Cascades, you know, the question, it's a little bit uh, more unsettled. However, there are, um, poaching issues aside, there are some reasons to be optimistic. We are getting some documentation of animals kind of outside the lookout pack territory and nearby locations. And those two animals on the right, one's from the Highway 20 corridor, the other one's from the Okanagan Valley and the Pine Creek drainage. Uh, let's see, that one on the top was from 2008. This one was this summer, the one on the bottom right. So we know we've got a couple of other animals wandering around out there. And then up at Hosemean, I went up this spring, a lot of tracks and scat. I would say there's maybe two to four animals minimum in the Hosemean area at Ross Lake. So the Cascades, although our pack has had some setbacks, I'm still guardedly optimistic we're, we're moving forward. So what have we learned about these guys over the last couple of years? Well, 
they use a pretty big territory. That's, that's kind of a rough approximation of their territory. It's about 350 square miles, give or take. And that's pretty much on par with what they saw in the Rockies with their reintroduced animals. When you get wolves in an environment where they've got no competition, they tend to set up, I mean, they, they use large territories anyway, but their territories are really big, and they don't have other nearby packs competing for space. As we predicted, they essentially follow the deer. That's their main, main prey base in the Okanagan or the Metau Valley. So they're near the valley floor in the winter where the deer are, and they're up high in the meadows in the summer. Like other places, uh, we think they use beaver here, but we had a couple of interesting um, side notes on secondary prey. They've discovered wild turkeys, which uh, I, I'm fond of. I, I like the fact that they're taking a few turkeys. Um, and they, they discovered salmon carcasses in the Twist River this past fall, which was really interesting for us. We've been able to visit I, am, I briefly mentioned rendezvous sites. This is the area where they stash pups you know, kind of midsummer when the adults are hunting, and we've been able to visit several rendezvous sites. The interesting thing there is that in the Rockies, it's usually a little open meadow, kind of a wet meadow near some heavy timber is kind of a traditional rendezvous site. Over here, we're not seeing that. We're seeing, oh, they're just using a variety of different sites, none of which really fit the, the Rockies model of a, of a uh, rendezvous site, which is, again, perhaps unique to their coastal lineage. Like I said, we were able to go to the den site and kind of document it. It's, it's on a little side hill, sandy, loamy soil. You can see like a little dirt pile up there just near one of the entrance holes. There were at least four different entrance holes, three, at least three of which were interconnected. Deer parts, scats all over the place. And here's a quick video of... Um, looking into a wolf den. I'm guessing nobody in the room's looked into a wolf den before. Take a look around. That's pretty cool. There's tunnels going off. You can see light coming in from the other side over there. There's another hole. To what extent are the wolves actually protecting that? Of course that. They dig it out. They dig it out. And just as a side note, we think we uh, we think we oops, I'm sorry. We think we really know what happened to Michael Jackson based on some evidence we found on <laughs> some. <laughs> that was actually near the den, a little white sparkly glow. So we talked earlier a little bit about the um, the keystone effects that wolves can have on an ecosystem, and so the question would be, well, what kind of effects do we expect to see in our ecosystem? And that's kind of an unknown. You know, we think there will be some interactions and potentially some some changes in the way cougars and coyotes use the landscape with wolves. And of course, you know, they may have a, a, an impact on our deer distribution and behavior. And in the Meadow, have most of the people in this room been to the Meadow? No, not so much? Okay, well, it's, um, you know, it's on the east side of Highway 20 as you go over Washington Pass, and there's lots of deer. More importantly, there's lots of deer right on the valley floor. And the local residents sometimes get a little frustrated because there's all kinds of conflicts with eating, you know, your tomatoes and, and uh, eating your crops if you're in agriculture. And one of the big, big things is vehicle damage. We hit a lot of deer with vehicles in the middle. That's my truck after I hit one at 60 miles an hour. I'm usually really good at avoiding them, but I, they, they got me. You know, sooner or later, you're going to hit one. And so people are asking, well, are the wolves going to help us solve this deer problem? Well, maybe. The problem is, if they're right there on the valley floor eating deer, are they going to get into trouble, though, and you know, become a conflict in and of themselves. I'm not sure. We'll see. I like the idea of some natural regulation versus some of the alternatives that have been suggested over the years. You know, <laughs> but um, I don't know. The jury's still out. We'll see how this all plays out. So for the future, we're continuing to monitor our, our alpha male. You know, the pack status is really questionable right now. What are we? We're in October. So in early December, I'll be surveying deer again, and we're going to make a very concerted effort with a helicopter to try to find Dad and whoever might be with him and get a good visual. I, you know, who knows? Keep your fingers crossed. Could be we look down and there's a bunch of pups. I don't think that's going to happen, but I can't rule it out. Um, there's some prey interaction research that's been proposed from a researcher out of U, U, University of Washington. Is that right? Yeah. And we hope, assuming we have a functioning pack, to get some satellite collars out. We have not had satellite collars on our animals, just standard VHF radio collars where you've got to go out and get the beep. It's a little more 
labor intensive. Um, we just were in scramble mode when we originally put them on. So we're hoping to improve there. And we're continuing to look for additional packs or animals nearby. With wolves come management issues. It's not just biology. You know, in fact, about three quarters or more of wolf management is people management and conflict prevention and resolution. The big issues, of course, are livestock, potential livestock interactions and potential impacts on big game species. So those are, those are issues we have to address. And wolf, you know, I, um, I have to say this because it's, it's true. Wolf population management um, is a big issue, and it, it's an active management species. What I mean by that, it's not an animal that you just, you know, you put it out in the landscape and it does its thing, or they come back and you just, they're just there and, and you don't worry about them. They are going to get into conflict sooner or later with livestock or pets or whatever. And so they're always going to be an animal that you know, we're going to be actively managing, which is going to include removing them occasionally. I think, you know, my, my uh, and there's a variety of ways we can do that. When we get enough on the landscape, they can be de delisted. We can hunt them or we can remove them with control actions or, you know, they, there's a, or we can let animal damages animal or wildlife services do that work for us. I think ideally, if we have enough on the landscape to where we can, we can put them in a, in a game status mode and have a legal hunting season on them, that means they're viable. You know, we wouldn't do that unless there are enough animals on the landscape that they're self-sustaining and they're a functional part of our ecosystem. And the, I think the advantage of that is that then if people start to think of wolves as just one more large carnivore on the landscape like black bears or cougars, which we actively hunt now and manage, they become less of a demon. You know, they're just one more carnivore in the, in the fray, and I think it will help reduce this extreme polarization that we get with wolves. That's just kind of my personal bias in terms of long-term management. But we're not anywhere near that stage yet, so in the early phases here, we're doing a lot of outreach, um, trying to educate ranchers, you know, how to prevent conflicts, teach the public about wolves. There's, there's very little human safety risk associated with wolves, despite some of the pressure here. I never say zero. It's a large carnivore. There's always some risk. But you know, I, if you were to look at the other carnivores potentially in this ecosystem, or the ones we know, cougars and grizzly bear, or cougars and black bears, and potentially grizzlies, and then throw wolves into that mix, of the four, I'm least concerned about wolves interacting with people. So this transitions then into kind of the bigger picture Paul talked a little bit about their conservation work, and wolves are um, one of the species that, that need large landscape level conservation. You know, we talked about 600 mile dispersal distances and big home ranges, and so maintaining connectivity, not only within our ecosystem, but with adjacent ecosystems is important, and I've been really involved in an effort in my, my district, which is essentially Okanagan County, which is all of this area to protect habitat and we focused to some degree on an east-west corridor here in the Okanagan Valley so that these wide-ranging carnivores can cross this landscape. Well, is that really feasible? I mean, can we really protect corridors? Will these animals really use those kinds of corridors? Well, I don't have a good wolf example yet because we're still early in the wolf recovery phase here, but I've got some great examples from a couple of other critters. So this is a radio-colored wolverine that we trapped last spring so to give you some scale here, you know, here's Seattle here. Here's the North Cascades and the park. This is like we caught her in the upper Twisp River. This is the size, roughly the size of an average wolverine home range, which is about double the size of a wolf range. So we're talking big, six, seven hundred square miles. This little wolverine that weighed about 20 pounds dinked around here in the North Cascade or the uh, Sawtooth a little bit, then went north all the way through the Pesaden, up here to cross, this is the Canadian border, crossed into Canada, all the way up to Carameos, wandered up here to, Cam, or to uh, Princeton, way up here to Kamloops, uh, crossed the Fraser River, I can't even reach that far, there's Kamloops, way up there, crossed the Fraser River, ended up in the coast range in BC, ran into a mountain lion on a deer kill and got killed. So that's, that's probably just connecting the dots it's probably close to a 500 mile trek. And you know she probably actually wandered around more than that. So, and that, that's radio collar locations or satellite collar locations. So yeah, these animals can move great distances, corridors are important. Another example that I think is pretty cool is 
couple of years ago, there was a grizzly bear that showed up in the, the, the Bitterroots on the kind of the Idaho-Montana border down here. Hadn't been bears there since like 1946. Unfortunately, that bear got shot by a hound hunter, misidentified as a black bear, but <clears throat> the interesting part of the story was that when they did the DNA analysis, it looked like it came from the Selkirks up here. So if you connect a point farthest south in the Selkirks with, which, with uh, where this animal was shot, it's 141 miles. And I got to thinking about that, man, that's a long way. So what if that animal had gone a different direction? Well, if that animal had gone west, it would have ended up in Winthrop. So just to give you an idea, these animals make big movements. And yep. The bear where the hunter was assured that there are no possible grizzlies in that area? Yes. He was okay. and he was hunting over bait. So the bear animal walked in. So even though he'd been assured, I mean he had a really good look at this animal. So I, eh. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Questions and uh, I think Paul, are you gonna say a few words after or not? Yeah, after the questions. Okay. You can turn the lights on. Yes. They have the ability to disperse that far. Now, whether or not they'd get through, you know, the development without conflict and any number to colonize, uh, it's going to be could conceivably, conceivably they could, there. and you could conceivably move them there. And would they do well if they got there? Yeah, they'd do well if they got okay. there. Next question on a cross-country skier and I ski in, in, yeah. in, in the Met House Valley. Yeah. And I don't always ski with other people. Um, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're going with this. I mean, you know, what's it like? Do our wolves going to approach you? Or are they skittish enough? Or are they going to stay away? Or what do you do when they um, choose you? And I, you know, these guys pretty much just avoid people. They're not super afraid, but they just, they're really sneaky. Like our, our alpha female, I, I wish she, I hope she's still alive, but she was the sneakiest critter. You know, I would try to get visuals on her and I, she's just, she'd slink away every time. So no, I don't think there's a lot to worry about. Like, you know, you never say never. But when I'm skiing by myself in the med house, especially if it's kind of late in the day, what I'm thinking about is cougars. Yeah, and there's a couple of trails that are yeah. kind of at the edge of deer winter range, and I see uh, my, my house is on one of the ski trails, and I see cougar tracks at my house all the time in the winter. So that's what I'm thinking about, and I'm carrying bear spray just in case for that cougar. Um, I'm not super concerned about the wolves, no. Okay, I've got my third question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you say the, the, the goal of the draft plan had delisting at... 12 to 15, 15 breeding pairs. Yeah. Delisting means it's open for a open season on hunting? Or? Not necessarily. It means we have that option at that point. We have the option to set up a hunting season or do whatever we think is appropriate, you know, given the circumstances. And hard to say what that will be until we get there. Is, is, it, is it likely that it would be sort of open hunting or is it is somewhat, I have no idea, like, how the hunting world works. Do you mm -hmm. issue individual licenses? To I can say with a lot of certainty that if, when and if we hunt wolves here, it'll be by permit. And it'll be... Per, per, you buy a permit for one animal? Is that yes. How it works? Okay. There'll be a quota and it'll be probably geographically limited. You know, it'll be pretty high, tight, tightly regulated. Yep. So why, why, why is this the route to take a you know, when you give someone a permit and then he doesn't know if it's a grizzly or a black bear, you know, suddenly things happen. Why don't you just catch them and like, like, uh, um, sorry, English is not my name, neuter or whatever you do to them instead of having people just, yeah. you know, do I know. That. I know what you're saying. And it, it kind of gets back to your, your point. He was told there were no grizzly bears in that area, so he just assumed any bear that came in on that bait was going to be a black bear. And, you know, so that's... He, might, he probably didn't even care, right? So, oh, so they... no, no, because he, he actually turned himself in, and he, he, you know, he was sorry that he'd made the mistake. But um, most places now where there's any chance of there being a grizzly bear, for instance, um, hunters are given educational materials or in some cases even required to watch educational videos before they go in the woods. So we are addressing that issue. But yeah, the, the, the credo for any hunter always, always is know your target before you pull the trigger, period. Mm -hmm. How do you resolve conflicts with ranchers and people that have lost livestock? Well, that's a whole talk in and of itself. But quickly, for a long time, there's been a compensation program funded through Defenders of Wildlife that compensated ranchers for verified wolf kills. Um, with the delisting 
of the animal, that will shift probably to more, the funding going to more preventative measures. Now the listing status is in the courts going back and forth. That's an incredibly complicated issue. I would envision in this state we'll have some kind of a compensation program going forward for a while yet. I'm not sure how we're going to fund it as of this date, but uh, that, that's my guess. Yes? Speaking of Defenders of Wildlife, we get all sorts of literature from them about aerial wolf hunting yeah. and uh, poisoning cubs in their dens and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, I'd just be interested to hear what your thoughts are on what the um, campaign or the uh, management approach. <laughs> I'll see, without getting myself into too much trouble. Um, I, do think, I do think there's been some fairly egregious ideas put forward in terms of how to manage wolves in Idaho and Alaska and whatnot. So I'm not a big fan of these massive uh, killing campaigns. But I do agree that you, you do need active management with wolves. You are going to have to remove some. It's just a question. The devil's in the details. How and where you do that, though, is, is important. And so I, I, there, there could be improvement. And I, so I do think some of their issues are valid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other parts of the country, I know that wolf coyote interbreeding has been a problem, or at least a common event, I think, depending on how you count it. Is that, is that something you're concerned about in Washington? No, and it's not as common as you think. In, eastern, in the eastern part of North America, at some point there was some coyote-wolf hybridization. Uh, we have not, I don't think, ever documented that in the West. So it's not, number one, even back east, it's not something that occurs frequently. It is possible. I mean, they can breed with your dog, too, for that matter. But um, no, right now, that's not a big concern. The bigger concern is wolf-dog hybrids that we intentionally create and keep as pets. And I'm, this is my little soapbox spiel. They don't make good pets. I completely support legislation to outlaw them in the state of Washington. Is legal right now? It is, okay. yeah. Mitch. <laughs> that's a, hi, I didn't see you come in. Um, the pine creek wolf, Any, what are your thoughts on its origins, its connections to the packs, its behavior with that tucked up tail? Tucked up tail, just that's not unusual at all to me. If you had a single animal, especially a younger animal moving across the landscape, it's going to feel pretty insecure, feel pretty subordinate, and that's pretty typical subordinate behavior. Um, its its appearance looks a lot like our lookout pack wolves. You know, it's kind of got that coastal BC gestalt to it. We uh, when that picture surfaced, we had a lot of people coming forward saying, "Oh, so and so, their hybrids loose." We chased down like four different hybrid rumors, all of which we were able to prove were false. I mean, it was not that animal. So I think it's most likely a wild wolf. Um, I'm guessing it came from the Cascades, not the Rockies, but without DNA, we we won't know. My third question. Okay. I read somewhere that wolf packs are much more manageable if rather than eliminating the alpha male or the alpha female that you remove subordinate creatures. Is, is that true and is there some way that that could be enforced if there were the case that they were hunting? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, I, I'm going to say I think there is some truth in that and I think that extends beyond wolves. I think that extends to other large carnivores. Cougars come to mind right off the bat. Yeah, when you have stable territories like big males with stable territories and they're not getting into trouble, it's not the animal you want to remove. You know, because those big males are actively killing, in the case of cougars, younger males that come into their territory. So there's some self-regulation there. And if you've got a well-behaved animal, you know, don't take that one out. I think wolf packs are kind of the same way. If you've got an established pack, it's actively defending a territory. Now, if they're not getting into trouble with livestock or whatever, pets, yeah, I'd, I wouldn't mess with them because they're, they're a buffer. You know, they're actively keeping other animals out of that territory. So there is something to that. Mm -hmm. So now I want to go back to my question. Yep. Oh, let me, the okay, let me, let me real, real quickly. But to answer your question, can you, can you effectively do that, say, with a hunting season? Probably yeah. not. No, you're not going to be able to tell in most cases, especially without a lot of experience, which is the alpha animal, for instance. You're just not going to know. So to my point then, yeah. why, are, why, are you, why would that be considered? If now you got the hunters not knowing what they're killing. Why don't you just um, want to do it by, by murdering them or, you know? Oh, I see, the animals themselves. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, tend to, I was thinking along a different line, but yeah, so we didn't, we didn't pass that behavior down through the generations. Um, <laughs> the, short, the short answer is that that's, 
it's really labor and resource intensive to try to capture wolves. I mean, we do it basically because we have to for management so purposes. This but this is your life career, and you're telling me it's labor intensive and hard? Well, no, it's not. It's, uh, let me, to, to do that, there's, there's like a thousand wolves in Idaho. And so to try to catch all those animals is just not feasible unless you guys want to pay way higher taxes, you know. So I don't, it's, it's logistics, it's resource availability, and we don't, you know, we're not, um, that would change the behavior of the animals. You know, the whole pack structure would break down w without the ability to breed. I mean, the, the hormonal regulation, it's, it's just not a very viable solution. I know it's, it seems like maybe you could do that. It's the, the better solution in, or the more realistic solution is to focus your harvest in those areas that are chronic conflict areas, you know, close to the urban interface and whatnot. You know, we don't, we don't really need to be shooting wolves in the middle of the wilderness area for the most part. Now, some of the big game hunters would disagree because of impacts to deer and elk, but, you know, I think the majority of the focus needs to be where we've got chronic conflicts. Huge variations in, in the Idaho population estimate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I came from there, and so I, I, yeah. I'm seeing people on both sides that who have massive disagreement. Um, I, you know, I, without being really involved over there, I think the official state or federal estimates are probably pretty good. I think where you get the big disagreement is when you got the ranchers and the environmentalists coming up with their own estimates. I would. And this, and this is a case where I do tend to trust the government. I mean, I think, I think the official estimates are about as good as you're going to get. Okay. And I think they are reasonably accurate. Yep. I mean, this question of nutrient versus hunting, it's more than just the bull side. I mean, it's, it's also trying to get as much support as you can for the whole hunting lo lobby, which is a pretty influential community. That can actually right. help with Absolutely, and that's why my vision is if we treat this as just another big game animal, give it that status, we manage it as such, we manage it for sustainable populations with some amount of sustainable harvest, we focus that harvest where we've got conflict, I think that is in the best interest of both the wolves and the hunting community because they get buy-in, they get a recreational opportunity, you know, we're, we're able to manage the conflict level. They start thinking of it, it's just like a bear or a cougar. It's not such a big deal anymore. It's not the end of hunting and ranching as we know it. You know, it's, so it's, it brings the, the, uh, the whole issue down to an emotional level where it's more manageable. That's, at least that's my hope. Scott, thanks so much. You bet. Um, Um, since everyone's starting to take off for meetings, are there any questions about Conservation Northwest? I'll start by saying that, that as you know, um, we're during a giving campaign and many of you have supported the organization and we are undergoing, we, we are taking on our most aggressive efforts so far and that's to connect the Cascades to the Rockies through our Columbia Highlands initiative and we're looking for more support. So please remember us in the giving campaign this year. Uh, Mitch Friedman's here, and Mitch is our executive director and the founder of our organization. So, does anyone have any questions about Conservation Northwest or about our Columbia Highlands Initiative? Number, number, giving, campaign. giving campaign number? 2293. 2293. Again, 2293. So, you want to say a word? I don't have any images or anything, um, and I know you probably all think. Go to. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, this Saturday morning at I think seven, there's a I've got a half an hour interview on KEXP on Mind Over Matters about the Columbia Highlands Initiative, and we we did that this morning. We we did that this morning, and she went into some depth, so that'll be a good one. Um, Craig Romano, uh, a writer, a trails writer. Um, who published a book about the Columbia Highlands with us? He and I will be on Steve Scherer weekday on um, KUOW on November 22nd. 
And also, are we, Paul, are we going to do something next week where we're doing We're a hoping to do a, a Columbia yeah. Highlands Initiative event simulcast next week on the 25th. Um, and we'll let you know uh, if that's occurring. Make sure that you're signed in with Rachel and you'll hear about that. Any questions from anybody? Yeah. So I was uh, involved with funding this Loomis project many years ago, and uh, that's when I think I, I mean, this is a long time ago. But I'm just wondering if you could comment on how the priorities and challenges have changed over the last so many years for conservation efforts. Yeah. Well, our mission has always been to protect and connect the large wild areas from the coast to the Rockies. We believe that's the way that we'll maintain, uh, you know, healthy populations of, of all of our native and charismatic wildlife. The one thing that's changed was, you know, back when, when, I, when I started the group in 89, climate change was something off in the distance. We were trying to protect large areas and large critters for their present value. Well, now, you know, even if we, you know, choked off all the smokestacks today, we still have to deal with changes that are, at this point, inevitable. We have to help our ecosystems and wildlife adapt, just like our urban areas have to figure out how to adapt. And these corridors, uh, north-south, like we did in the Cascades Conservation Partnership, for those who remember that, we, we kept the Cascades whole. Classic north-south linkage great adaptation means and and Department of Transportation if you've been over Snoqualmie Pass lately they're putting in the underpasses and overpasses while rebuilding the highway very cool Cascade Rockies, to me has similar climate adaptation corridor values it's not quite east-west it's a little bit northeast by southwest <laughs> um, so that's that's a major change Loomis does fit in. For instance, if I were doing today a presentation on Columbia Highlands Initiative, the graphics I'd be showing are how our wilderness and federal lands conservation proposal plus our private land work on, on adjacent ranches fits in or overlaps with modeling on what links need according to uh, you know, the cutting edge modeling on, on links connectivity. And that, you know, Loomis was, was a step in that. It was many more steps to keep the landscape together. How do you measure success? I mean, do you, do you track whether the kind of, uh, the corridors are working the way you project they would? I think over time, you know, if we could get to a point 20 or 30 years from now where we have enough data points, uh, at this point it's more anecdotal, you know, when, when Two some years ago, when I came down off of Mount Baker, where I had seen a, a, a wolverine, I called, as soon as I got to my cell phone, I called Scott, and I said, Scott, you, yeah. you won't be... <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you jumped into my anecdote. No, no I was, I was <laughs> Sorry. telling a story, how I called you after I'd seen that wolverine. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I said, uh, you won't believe I saw a wolverine on Mount Baker. He said, well, yeah, that's nothing. I just collared two wolves. And... <laughs> and, and that was the very day that the lookout pack got confirmed and, and collared and some hair samples taken for DNA analysis. And the analysis of the DNA showed, we think, that one of the wolves came from sort of the coast ranges, one maybe came from the BC Rockies, and that was really affirming of the viability in real time of, of how landscape linkages are working. So our job becomes not restoring those linkages, but maintaining them. Yeah. How do you set priorities? The job seems so huge. Oh, we're almost done. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that to Ron. Uh, yeah. You send me money and I get it done. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of gestalt, you know, the best available science. Uh, you know, last year the image that I would have showed you in my slideshow was from 10-year-old science that some Forest Service biologists did on sort of paths of least resistance, least cost pathways for a hypothetical lynx or wolf or wolverine to get from you know, core area North Cascades to core area Rockies and other places. Well, now we have a new tool out, the 
We have the Washington Wildlife Habitat Connectivity Working Group with the biologists from the state and federal uh, wildlife and, and land management and transportation agencies doing the cutting edge, the best vanguard modeling on uh, wildlife connectivity in the West. And, and so we can look at that and, and, and evaluate where we've got our protections and where we need our protections. And I've already, for the past year, been lobbying in D.C. on projects that the Department of Transportation wants money for to fix bottlenecks identified by this modeling. So it isn't what you see over Snoqualmie Pass on I-90. We need some of the same things around Riverside on Highway 97 to complement the ranch easements that you know Scott and I and other groups have, have done right in that same area. So ranking them in terms of priority, that's partly you know the science and the needs. It's partly the opportunities. Uh, our job operating at such a large scale is to be catalytic. You don't get it one step at a time. And we think that Loomis, you know, people remember it because it was catalytic. It wasn't just, you know, the flavor of the day. Same thing with Cascades Partnership. We try to keep doing that. The Columbia Highlands Initiative, it's dragging on a bit. You know, I had hoped that it would, our wilderness proposal would have been passed by Congress and signed by George W. Bush. It's taken longer than we thought, and and uh, but the we've added dimensions to it. The private lands we're now up to about ten working ranches, not in Okanagan County, but in Ferry and Stevens and Ponderay counties that fit in. And so when it gets done, uh, I think it's going to be more catalytic. Um, I'm doing an awful job answering your question. <laughs> um, I think we'll be judged in the future by how well Candace's question is addressed, you know, whether it functions, whether we accomplished it efficiently. And when I compare the work we're doing, the gains on the ground, not just in terms of acres, but community engagement, what's remarkable about the Columbia Highlands isn't just the scale that we're filling in the pieces of this science-informed corridor and that it's federal land and private lands along the chain but that we're doing it with community support in a very conservative part of the state. Uh, so in theory, hopefully we gain momentum with each step. Um, you know, that's pretty cool if we can keep doing that for a while. Any other questions? Great. Well, well thank you again, Scott. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks to all of you for attending. And Remember us and, and keep an eye out for uh, the, the uh, a week from now on the 25th at 10 a.m. Thanks.